So he is a principal investigator from the US side, the whole consortium he leads from there. And from Indian side, we have Indian Institute of Chemical Technology. And a work, uh, under that, a work package, WP1, is led by Chrisat. And other uh, WP, WPs are led by different groups. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce the speaker to you today. Uh, of course, most of uh, his timelines uh, matches with my timelines. I don't know what is this coincidence. Um, he is basically a, a geneticist by training. He did his uh, master's from Wageningen University uh, in biomolecular engineering with highest honors in 1993. Of course, we first met in Wageningen only in 2012 in a conference. And then um, his PhD is from North Carolina State University. He did PhD in genetics. And then the postdoc in Purdue University in botany and plant pathology during 1999 to 2001. And then joined as an assistant professor of agronomy in agriculture and biological engineering, Purdue University, where our colleague, Dr. Gabi Saijeta, worked for a long time. And eventually, he, is, he was sorghum breeder at Ekrisat, and eventually he became a World Food Prize winner. And then he moved to uh, University of Florida as associate professor. And then to he became a co-editor-in-chief of bioenergy research. And he, I think he still continues to be the co-editor for that. And uh, then became the director of genetics and genomics graduate program, University of Florida from 2009 to 12. And from 2012 onwards, he is in the current position as an associate professor in University of Florida Genetics Institute, Microbiology and Cell Science Department. So today he is uh, here to deliver a talk on sustainable production of fuels and uh, chemicals from sorghum. As you know, this is very uh, interesting area for ICRISAT too. And without taking much time, I request Wilfred to give this presentation. Thank you. This talk will be roughly for 40-45 minutes and followed by 10 to 15 minutes for discussion. Thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, I am delighted uh, to, to be here and have the opportunity to share some of my research uh, with you. Um, I uh, consider ACRESAT uh, a, a uh, really top research institute when it comes to uh, sorghum breeding and, and genetics so it's an honor to be here uh, and I also uh, strongly endorse the, the overall mission of, of this institute so it, it's, it's, it's great to be here and meet you and learn more about what's happening. So um, I'm going to start with uh, the satellite uh, overview uh, that defines um, a lot of the, the research that I do. And uh, that um, is highlighted in this, this picture here where we, we have the, the major challenges for, for agriculture uh, shown where we have a, a growing world population, people need to be fed. There is, uh, as, as developing countries uh, gain economic power, we typically see increases in animal uh, production. So. There is an additional need for agricultural crops to support livestock. At the same time, we have uh, major challenges associated with, with energy production. At the moment, uh, oil prices are extremely low, but I find it hard to imagine that that is going to continue to be like that for an indefinite period of time. And then we have a global climate change that will make agriculture much more challenging when we're dealing with more variable weather patterns and uh, probably more frequent occurrences of drought or flooding, uh, depending on where you are, shifts in climate zones, so appearances of new pests and diseases in areas where those were not common. So the, the real challenge, I, I think, is to try and this in a sustainable manner, basically twice the agricultural output with, with only half of the resources in order to meet all of these constraints. So I work uh, in, in Florida, and Florida is uh, 
in many ways uh, a good test case for agriculture for the future. Florida used to be the bottom of the ocean a long time ago, and so the Florida Peninsula, for the most part, is, uh, is uh, sand, and just like you see it on the beach. It's, it's a very poor soil with, with low um, nutrients and organic matter. At the same time, being in the southeastern United States, the sunny and warm climate has great potential uh, for uh, agricultural production. And so um, a lot of the research that I conduct is basically aimed at uh, coming up with, in my case, sorghums that do well under these challenging conditions with low organic matter content, low water retention capacity, high pressure of pests and diseases, and limitation on irrigation, uh, pesticides and fertilizer, just because uh, water is, is a... Uh, resource that is somewhat scarce in, in Florida and in a large part because the metropolitan areas in South Florida with Miami being the best known end up pulling a lot of the water that runs uh, from aquifers running from north, north to south and that limits the available water for uh, agriculture. So in, in, in essence uh, the um, challenge for us is to come up with re reliable crop production systems under increasingly challenging conditions uh, resulting from climate change and uh, increases in the world population. So we like sorghum and particularly sweet sorghum in, in Florida, South Florida especially, because of its complementarity with sugarcane infrastructure that's already there. And uh, the typical uh, sugarcane harvesting happens in our uh, winter months, so it starts in October, goes through uh, March, and uh, that leaves a large gap in the uh, sugar mills, and so it's possible to have two harvests of sweet sorghum that can fill in this gap that leaves then just some time in the spring during which you can do maintenance. So other benefits, of course, of, of sweet sorghum that you're familiar with is that it has limited input requirements of water and nutrients and uh, then as you can see in the background here uh, the um, biomass that is produced from this crop can be used as a lignocellulosic feedstock. So I've been working with a number of colleagues uh, in the recent years on uh, developing a sweet sorghum processing scheme that effectively takes all of the uh, crop biomass um, turns it into useful products and so the juice is of course easy to extract from sweet sorghum can be readily fermented by microbes to fuels and chemicals with depending on the microbial strain that is used and then the bagasse is treated as a lignocellulosic feedstock that goes through a pretreatment process whereby the cellulose is liberated and uh, that can then um, be enzymatically converted to uh, glucose whereas the um, hemicellulose fraction results in um, pentoses that tend to be liberated during the pretreatment. That is a, an acid steam pretreatment process that we use. These sugars can be fermented by microbes and also provide uh, chemicals and, and uh, fuels depending on the microbial strain. And then we're left with um, a um, waste stream from this process that is rich in lignin, an aromatic cell of polymer, and uh, that can be burned uh, to generate heat for distilling, for example, ethanol out of the fermentation broth. But that is a uh, low value use of, of the lignin. And we're also looking at alternative uses of the lignin, for example, by blending it with uh, polylactate uh, that can be used to make biodegradable plastics. And so by blending lignin with polylactate, uh, you can improve the elastic or thermochemical properties of these plastics. I will also share some information uh, with you on the use of lignin for nanotubes that have biomedical applications. And then we'll also be polymerizing lignin to produce jet fuel. Um, I won't have time to talk about that. So I moved to uh, Florida in 2006 and uh, I started to develop a 
plant breeding program for sorghum at that time. And one of the challenges, uh, as I alluded to uh, at the beginning of my presentation, is that uh, we're, we're, we have poor soils and, and uh, high pest and disease uh, incidents. And so when you take uh, sorghums that were developed in the traditional sorghum breeding areas, in Texas and the Great Plains, uh, you get uh, poor uh, yields. And uh, you, you just don't get the, the, the promise of this material um, realized. So I basically ended up setting up a, a breeding program from scratch uh, that was aimed at developing regionally adapted sweet sorghums to produce uh, decent yields with limited inputs. And uh, our number one target, uh, the, the, the must-have trait in any of the enhanced sorghum is anthracnose resistance. Anthracnose is a fungal disease that is present um, everywhere in the southeastern United States. And um, here you see some of the symptoms on the leaf. So when anthracnose covers a leaf, uh, photosynthetic capacity is uh, impaired. And when it attacks the stalk, you get rot inside of the stalk that basically uh, results in major losses from sugars in the juice and so unless you have resistance against this particular pathogen you, you can't really do anything. So here are some, some pictures of, uh, um, of the fungus so these are the initial uh, spores that germinate and they make an atmosorium from which these hyphae uh, invade the, the plant tissue schematically that's shown here so here are the canarial spores, they germinate through this aprosorium that pokes through the leaf surface. You got primary hyphae that sprout and secondary hyphae that penetrate the cells and kill them. And then from these hyphae we can get new uh, spores that can continue the cycle. Since the climate is mild in the southeastern United States, these uh, spores and Mycelia can overwinter easily, so next year you basically uh, start the cycle right up. So if you take some of the commercial sorghum uh, uh, into the field in Florida, this is uh, what you get. So uh, heavy uh, infestation with the, the fungus and very poor yields. And so by um, selecting for anthracnose resistance, we've come up with some really nice uh, sweet sorghums uh, that you can hopefully see the difference quite clearly in terms of the, the, the tolerance to this disease. And so here are some of the uh, production statistics. So M81E is uh, one of the traditional sweet sorghums that does reasonably well in, in Florida. This was developed in Mississippi and uh, it, it is the most used traditional sweet sorghum in, in Florida. So if people, you, when people used to put sweet sorghum in the field, this is what they would use. And we are doing substantially better with these improved uh, sweet sorghums, both in terms of, of sugars and, uh, and stock weights. So the, our, our um, dry weight yields are in 15 to 20 tons per hectare um, under these conditions. So we are um, working on identifying the genetic basis of, of anthracnose uh, resistance. And uh, PK7 is a uh, uh, grain sorghum that was developed in the um, north and west, western part of Florida uh, in, in an area where the conditions for sorghum are overall a little better than in the um, peninsula. The mechanism for resistance in this line is, is unknown, but you can clearly see the difference between the resistant PK7 and the susceptible early agari SART line that we used um, as the alternative parent for mapping population. And so I think you're all familiar with the concept of a mapping population. You basically create genetic mosaics of the two parents that you then phenotype susceptible uh, plants, shown here as yellow, versus 
a resistant plant shown here as green. And after genotyping these plants, you look for regions that are shared by the resistant material in the box here, red, versus the blue DNA from the susceptible parent at the same locus. So this particular segment of this chromosome is associated with the disease resistance. So we uh, have used uh, for genotyping uh, the GBS, genotyping by sequencing. Um, that is uh, a high throughput method that is now fairly routinely available uh, by Cornell University. So we extract the DNA, send it to Cornell, and it took about two months to get the data back. So one of the challenges with the current sequencing technology that is used for GBS is, is that it's, it results in what I'm referring here as, as dirty data. There is, you get an impressive number of markers from this procedure, 130,000. So when we first saw those results, we were extremely excited. But when you then start to look more closely at these data, one of the uh, complications from the Illumina uh, high throughput sequencing platform is that there is a fairly high proportion of sequencing mistakes that are just inherent to the technology. So my, my student Terry Falberhoff has developed a filtering procedure. Uh, we've just submitted a manuscript that includes this procedure and one that is uh, accepted uh, hopefully in the near future that filtering procedure will be uh, available to, to everybody um, as a SAS file download. And so, uh, as you can see here, we, we go from 130,000 SNP markers in the original data, and this is after a, a rough cleanup, and we end up with a near 5,000. That's still exciting when you consider that 10 years ago we were you know, still mapping with SSR markers, and we were excited with 250 markers. So this is still a, a great number for genotyping purposes obviously not nearly as um, as many as you start out with and so that has as i mentioned a lot to do with just the sequencing uh, errors that are generated in this procedure so um, the um, association between the genotypic and phenotypic data in our case was done through fisher's exact test where we basically expected that the bk7 alleles were more frequently associated with resistance compared to the early agari SART alleles that we expected to be more commonly associated with susceptibility. So um, we um, basically test for this association and um, then calculate uh, a um, probability value that you can then use across the markers. So that is summarized here. So we basically have cutoff values depending on the location, uh, the red and, and green lines. So they're, they're similar. So anything that consistently um, sticks above this line is of interest. And we have the 10 sorghum chromosomes listed here. And so the, the two um, consistently uh, present regions associated with resistance are here on chromosome 7 and on chromosome 9. And you notice here that the, the locus on chromosome 7 is really wide. It's a massive QPL, whereas the one on chromosome 9 is much smaller. So uh, when you look at this in more detail, on chromosome 7 we're dealing with a 44.9 megabase region with 740 transcripts. So that is way too many to uh, do any meaningful follow-up experiments with at this time. Chromosome 9 um, is a much smaller region with uh, 342 transcripts. So by looking at the uh, annotation of these transcripts, we were able to reduce both uh, loci to much more manageable numbers, 46 and 39 candidate genes. So that, that's still quite a few, but not as intimidating. But now I mentioned that some of our 
resistant cultivars were derived from the same pattern that was used in the mapping population in that line BK7. And so here is an example of where the breeding program and the genetics efforts were able to uh, complement each other very nicely. And so from the mapping work, we were able to narrow down uh, this region on chromosome 9 to 3.2 megabases. But then we went back to the resistant cultivars that we developed from the same resistant parent that had undergone many more generations uh, of breeding and uh, selection. And so our hypothesis was that we will have selected against uh, genes that were coming from the PK7 parent but not really relevant for Sweet's organ. And so since we were selecting for resistance against the fungus, the resistance genes would be retained. So we ended up uh, working with four of these cultivars and mapping the resistance locus on chromosome 9 in these four lines and noticing that the overall components from the resistant parent cultivar varied quite a bit in size, but the combined result is that we were able to reduce the region where the resistance resides down to um, only 500 kilobases with, with just six candidate genes remaining. So in this case, the, the breeding material was able to significantly re reduce the uh, interval of interest. And so now we're getting ready to, uh, to evaluate these six candidate genes using virus-induced gene silencing with the Bro mosaic virus that has three uh, RNA molecules as its genome. And so in one of those RNA molecules, we're introducing the candidate resistance gene in a two or 300 base pair fragment. We then inoculate a, a leaf from a resistant line. The leaf is going to be still on the plant in order to keep it alive, of course, but we get the inoculation of the leaf. Then the virus um, is recognized by the plant and uh, activates a, a resistance mechanism against the virus that will, because of the presence of the candidate resistance gene, result in the inactivation of the resistance gene. So now we inoculate this leaf with fungal spores, or autotrophin spores, and if we really did silence the resistance gene, the um, spores will germinate successfully and, uh, and infect the leaf tissue and then cause disease symptoms. So that is the, the way we are planning on validating uh, the candidate genes and this is something that uh, your um, former colleague uh, Srinivas Rao is currently uh, setting up. So that's all the disease resistance so that is a must-have trait in the southeastern United States. I am now switching to quality issues and so uh, one of the ways to improve biomass conversion is by manipulating biomass composition and one of the ways that I like to modify this as well as you here is the introduction of ground midrib mutations in sorghum and you can see the brown vesicle tissue in these plants. So these mutations were originally developed at Purdue University. This is a, an image from a sheep grazing trial that was conducted there at the time by, uh, by the late uh, Professor Axtell. And so sheep got a choice between normal sorghum and brown midrib sorghum and uh, it's pretty clear which ones they preferred. The USDA uh, station in Lubbock, Texas uh, developed a tilling population for sorghum that also contained a large number of brown midrib mutants. And so we've also worked with that population. And so the overall, uh, our overall interest in this material is to figure out what the impact of these mutations is on biomass conversion, especially for the production of biofuels and chemicals. 
and also then to clone uh, the problem major genes themselves uh, so that they can be converted to molecular markers and also to uh, learn more about the impact of, of these mutations on the overall chemistry and biochemistry of the plant with the ultimate goal of enzyme engineering and I'll explain that a little bit later. So here is a rudimentary schematic of the lignin biosynthetic pathway with phenylalanine shown here at the top. It gets converted through a large number of enzymatic reactions uh, whereby the um, carboxyl group on the propane side chain is reduced to an alcohol group and we get substitutions of the um, ring here so single hydroxyl group, methoxyl group, two methoxyl groups and this distinguishes the different kind of residues in the lignin. The lignin is uh, formed from um, oxidative coupling of, of these um, monomers to give a very complex polymeric structure. So we've um, originally started out cloning Brahmajib 12 that catalyzes this uh, step here so it's critical for the methylation of the 5-hydroxyl group on the phenol ring. Uh, then brown 6 um, encodes the um, cinnamyl alcohol dehydrogenase that is responsible for uh, reducing the aldehyde group on the side chain to an alcohol. And then um, last, uh, the last one to be cloned was brown 2 That is important in the early steps of the pathway. So we get the addition of the uh, SCOA group um, on the, um, so in the, in the early phases of the reduction <coughs> of the carboxyl group. So when we look at the lignin content of this material, and this is from the Purdue collection, you see that in all cases the, the brown bars indicating the brown major mutants are lower than the green bars indicating the lignin content for the wild type uh, counterparts. So all brown midrip mutations result in some reduction in lignin content and that reduction varies a little bit on the, the, the nature of the mutation. So when we then uh, subject the biomass from these mutants to enzymatic scarification, so we basically break down the cellulose converted to glucose, you see that in this case the, the brown bars are for the most part higher than the green bars. That means that from the same amount of biomass we get more fermentable sugars um, in the brown midrip mutants than in the um, wild type counterparts except in BMR19 when this is actually the opposite. So that is the one mutant in that collection that behaves in a way that is somewhat puzzling and certainly not helpful for improving biomass conversion. The great thing is that um, these differences remain after, in, our, in this case, a dilute sulfuric acid pretreatment. So it's, these are on the same scale, so you clearly see uh, the benefit of the pretreatment. Your um, sugar yields go up about threefold by doing this dilute sulfuric acid pretreatment of the biomass. But Percentage-wise, the uh, brown midrip mutations are still resulting in higher sugar yields. So what that means is that you get more sugars from the same amount of biomass, or that you can get by with more um, with with milder pretreatment conditions that are cheaper, and therefore you save some money on the conversion process. So one of the things we've learned is that lignin content itself is not the sole predictor of biomass conversion efficiency. And we learned this from studying an allelic series of Brown-Midrip-12, the nucleic acid omethotransferase gene. And uh, I'll explain uh, what we've learned from that. So here is, um, this is from the Texas collection in the USDA. So wild type, BTX623. And brown midrip 12, this is the reference allele from the Purdue collection. That's a, a null mutant, so no COMP is made. And so we see a reduction in the lignin uh, content. The amount of lignin that's there is significantly reduced. 
And we have three intermediate mutants, so these are different alleles from the, the USDA collection that are intermediate in uh, the lignin content. So we've done then the um, analysis of the, the lignin, so the S to G ratio, so these are the, the two types of subunits in the lignin. Normally that's uh, 0.63 in the wild type. The um, BMR12 mutant virtually makes no S units, so this ratio becomes uh, very tiny. And then you see here the intermediate alleles are a little bit higher than the null allele or really intermediate. Here we're looking at the, the glucose yield from the biomass from these plants. So again, the brown mitric 12 mutants substantially more glucose per gram biomass than the wild type control. And here are the intermediate alleles. And so these different letters indicate the statistical differences. So if the letter is different, there is a statistically significant difference in the means. So here's what we learned. So lignin content alone does not explain all the variation in glucose yield. So these two lines have statistically no significant difference between them and lignin content, but they do yield different amounts of sugars. So the difference in sugar yield is significantly different. So same amount of lignin, different amounts of sugars. S to G ratio does appear to be a better indicator of how much sugar is released here. Um, so we have here significantly higher yields of sugars when these S to G ratios are very low. And so somewhere when we go from 0.08 to 0.42, we see that switch back to wild type levels of sugars. Right? So the threshold on the, in the S to G ratio is somewhere, based on these data, between 0.08 and 0.4. So we've also used the same lines for detailed structural um, analyses of the COMT, COMT enzyme. And so here is the reaction again. So we get the methylation of the hydroxyl group here uh, from 5-hydroxy uh, coniferaldehyde to um, synapaldehyde. So through X-ray crystallography of crystallized COM2 enzyme that was produced in, in E. coli, so it's a common enzyme, we've learned that uh, the um, COMT uh, enzyme is generally present as a dimeric structure. So we have the red and the green here to indicate, and there is then a region where they interact. Here is the catalytic site. And then the blue dots indicate some of the mutations that have occurred as a result of these BMR12 mutants. Here we're looking at the catalytic site. This is the substrate, the 5 hydroxyconephraldehyde. You see that the aldehyde portion is, is bound here. Uh, and then here is the methyl donor that is going to provide methyl group that gets added on the hydroxyl group here and then on the, uh, the surrounding amino acids hold this structure in place through hydrogen bonds. That's what these dotted lines represent. So one of the questions as I mentioned earlier is can we engineer COMT and other enzymes um, based on, on uh, what we learn from these kinds of analyses. And you can imagine that when you start modifying some of these residues it will impact the catalytic behavior of this enzyme. And so one of the uh, things we, we learned from working with this purified recombinant COMT is that as the substrate concentration goes up, um, you see that the initial velocity goes down. So what this reflects is inhibition by the substrate of this enzyme. So if you have too much uh, substrate accumulating in the plant, it will reduce in a less effective conversion. It will, re it will reduce the enzyme activity and result in a less effective conversion of the substrate.
And one of the uh, mechanisms behind this inhibition uh, is that the substrate can basically uh, fit into the catalytic pocket in the uh, wrong orientation. So this is how it's supposed to bind. And so notice the aldehyde group is bound here. And then we have the uh, phenolic component of the substrate molecule also nicely bound here. But the substrate can also go into the catalytic pocket in what looks like a flipped orientation. This is an isomer. The aldehyde can still interact here, but the uh, aromatic portion of the substrate is now flipped. So rather than have the methoxyl group on C3 uh, in this hydrophobic pocket, it's now sticking out in the other direction. And so here is our methyl group that needs to be donated to here and that's not going to happen. So this is non-productive binding and that is possible because the molecule, the substrate molecule, does fit into the enzyme in this wrong orientation. So here are the two isomers again. And because this is a uh, strongly aromatic structure, you cannot just flip between these uh, two orientations, the productive versus the non-productive binding and that's what these big peaks uh, reflect. So here we're basically spinning around this axis here and it costs a huge amount of energy to, to make this flip whereas the alcohol and uh, acid versions of this molecule can flip around much more easily. So basically this particular uh, structure is pretty rigid. When it goes in in the wrong orientation it results in non-productive binding and basically occupies the space without being converted and that is why you see the enzymatic activity go down. So our question then is, you know, can we use the detailed structural picture that we've acquired here to make a COMT enzyme that no longer is subject to this uh, inhibition or basically we modify the substrate binding pocket in a way that this non-productive binding can no longer occur. Other targets would be to modify lignant subunit composition and this is not restricted to just COMT, it can also happen with different enzymes. Basically create a lignant subunit composition that is going to provide a perfect balance between biomass conversion and for example agronomic performance with, with lodging common problem with, with mutants uh, in these enzymes. So, um, so that, that really um, gets, gets into uh, detailed uh, work on, on pathway modification. I'm now going to go back to the larger scale processing and share with you a couple of our experiences there. And we work with a company called Delta Biorenewables in Memphis, Tennessee to, uh, to do the, the large-scale uh, juice extraction. And they use either sugarcane harvesters or forage choppers to harvest the biomass. And then that gets collected in a wagon and put through an industrial size uh, roller mill. So you see the biomass come in from the top here and then uh, the juice drips out the, the bottom here. There is a mesh that collects any plant debris and then the juice goes through the mesh. And um, the, uh, on the other side of this chute and, and press is a conveyor belt that brings the crushed stems, the bagasse, into a collection wagon that you see here. So we ended up um, generating several tons of uh, bagasse that way that had to then get shipped from Memphis to a pilot by a refinery in, uh, in Perry uh, using a large truck and uh, that was delivered then in these big bags. This is the original crushed uh, stems. They had to be broken down further with a um, shredder into smaller pieces that were able to be used in the pretreatment process. The pilot biorefinery is uh, 
looks like this. Uh, this was supported uh, with funding from the state of Florida. And uh, here is a, a picture of the pretreatment unit. So the, uh, this is elevated. So the biomass gets brought in with a conveyor and then goes into a steam reactor that is infused with phosphoric acid. And then you get a slurry that is dropped uh, down to a lower level and treated with uh, cellulases to create a pumpable slurry that is then subjected to um, fermentation. So the fermentation is done in 10,000 gallon or 40,000 liter reactors that are shown here. So this is really uh, at a scale that allows you to uh, get um, results and data for industrial purposes. So all of the uh, processing was uh, uh, done and numbers were collected along the way on the cost of uh, all the um, chemicals that were used and electricity that was used. And so that resulted in a technical economic analysis that is summarized here. So the different categories of um, uh, the, the inputs are shown here. There are some credits for electricity when the lignin is burned. And also, since it's a phosph phosphoric acid pretreatment system, you get a um, residue after fermentation that is rich in phosphate that can be used as, um, as a fertilizer. So you get some, some credits there uh, in, from the use of the vanas, is what it's called, the liquid, uh, as a fertilizer. So in the end, we end up with uh, a, an ethanol price of $1.98 uh, per gallon. So that's uh, about $54 cents per liter. And that's really... Uh, pretty good, um, although it is under the most optimistic scenario. And this would have been truly exciting four or five years ago when the oil, oil prices were really high. But at the moment, we are paying for gasoline in the United States somewhere around $1.70 per gallon. So when this is the production price of the ethanol, it's clear and that is not competitive, especially since the ethanol itself only holds about 70% of the energy value of gasoline. So that is um, something uh, of, of concern for, for biofuel production. And one of the alternative strategies is rather than use uh, sugars, the fermentable sugars for ethanol, to convert them instead to chemicals and so butyric acid one of the chemicals that we're producing now, and in this case with clostridium. And alternatively, you can make optically pure, so pure D or pure L, lactic acid, in that case with bacillus uh, coagulants. So the expectation is that these chemicals are uh, going to be able to compete better with existing alternatives, um, and at least for the time being. Uh, provide a better use of the sugars than production of uh, biofuels. And so I find myself now in the, the awkward position of you know, wishing that the oil prices were higher, uh, even though obviously uh, we all enjoy being able to drive uh, our cars for less money at the moment. So the, the last couple of minutes of the presentation, I want to talk about some biomedical applications of um, lignin. And uh, the, I need to introduce the concept of smart delivery first. And so here is an example of a, of a patient with a genetic disorder where the particular human gene is not doing its job. So the protein in the gene encodes is not being made. And so one option that uh, is being explored at the moment is to create a recombinant virus, in this case adeno-associated virus, that contains as part of its genome uh, the human gene uh, that when the virus infects the patient, in this particular case uh, the, the liver, 
the virus effectively brings in a functional copy of the human gene that is then expressed and provides the human protein that this patient cannot make. So that's, that's a strategy that is being explored. Uh, one of the challenges is that these viruses need to be administered in such high doses that the patients can get sick. And so an alternative is the use of carbon nanotubes that are loaded with either drugs or uh, DNA to accomplish the same thing. And the problem with the carbon nanotubes is that they are causing asbestos-like symptoms, they puncture cells, and they puncture uh, blood vessels, and so they have some, some issues there. But in all cases, the idea of, of the smart delivery is that you target specific or organs and at the same time protect the DNA that you're bringing in or the therapeutics that you're bringing in against degradation. So we, um, we have developed a procedure for making um, nanotubes, so these small structures from lignin by using a membrane template in, in which these um, are built. So this is a membrane seen from the top and the side. And here is the schematic of the membrane. So we coat the, the membrane with a lignin base layer. This is lignin from the biorefinery. And then these fragments are, are glued together uh, with um, an artificial lignin that we create, it's a dehydro dehydrogenation polymer. And uh, by dissolving the membrane in acid, you then release tubular structures, uh, and lots of them. This is a 10 to the 9 tubes per square centimeter, and so this is what that would look like. So all these uh, tubes are released from the membrane after the membrane is dissolved. We can play around with the composition of this liner. Uh, if we uh, change the liner composition by modifying the ratio of the building blocks, we get either hollow structures or some tubes versus wires, which are solid. Here's another type of image with a scanning electron micrograph. So this tube split open, you can see it's hollow. This is a, a wire. So when you subject the um, when you subject human cells and tissue culture to these tubes, uh, the toxicity is much lower than is typical for carbon nanotubes. So the concentration marked here by the red line is the concentration at which 50% of the human cells and tissue culture die when they're exposed to carbon nanotubes. And you see at that concentration the, the cell death survivability of the cells is still really good um, with, the, with the lignin nanotubes. These two graphs represent lignin isolated in, um, in, with different procedures. So when we saw these data, we were also curious why we do see some toxicity um, at higher levels of this particular lignin formulation. And so here are um, confocal microscope images of the HeLa cells, uh, the human cells and tissue culture, with the nanotubes. So here is the cell nucleus, here is the uh, outside of the cell, and here are the nanotubes. So they have penetrated the cells spontaneously. You don't have to do anything uh, special. And here is the, um, the other formulation. And so here again, nucleus and now we see nanotubes inside of the nucleus. So we think that the nucleus is not terribly thrilled so if you have too many of these structures inside and that, that does cause some toxicity. But then when we saw these data we thought wow if these tubes are going inside of the cells would we be able to deliver DNA this way? So we tried this so here are um, images of cells, just untreated cells treated with a um, plasmid encoding the green, green fluorescent protein and uh, transfected with a chemical agent, PEI. And then here are images of cells that were subjected to nanotubes made of lignin 
coated with this plasmid DNA. And um, you see all the green spots are, the, are indicating expression of GFP um, after that was taken up by the cells. So we were curious about the uptake mechanism. So one of the ways is that the DNA just piggybacks uh, along um, with the nanotubes and gets taken up via endocytosis. Um, an alternative is that the DNA is physically associated with the nanotubes and goes in. And a third option is that uh, we have the association and the, the, the nanotubes just zip right through the, the membrane. So we were able to show that there is a physical association between DNA and uh, nanotubes by using biotinylated DNA. That's what the little black symbols uh, indicate. When we mix that with magnetic beads that are coated with strapavidin on the outside, um, we um, can anticipate an interaction between them. It, it, uh, the biotin and strapavidin interact and then with a magnet we can pull this out of solution. So when we did this, indeed this is exactly what we saw. Here is the nanotube, here are the beads, and you see that the nanotubes are stuck on the beads because of the association with the DNA. If we use native DNA we do not see that association. Here is a little piece of nanotube but no beads are stuck to it. So we're also exploring the use of this uh, for therapeutic agents uh, getting delivered to specific cells with the use of a, 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 a homing device, if you will, that recognizes particular cell-specific receptors and uh, then would penetrate the cells where the drug would be released after cleavage of this label and bonds, such as an ester bond. So that is uh, a high value application of a waste product from the biorefinery and this, we, we've done this with sorghum lignin and it works just fine. And so um, well, we have to obviously make sure that, that this can be done in living organisms and not just cells, but um, the, the promise is pretty exciting. So I'll wrap up. Uh, with, with some conclusions. So uh, improving sweet sorghum, both as cultivars and hybrids, has great potential for uh, producing um, fuels and chemicals. And even if um, the land is not that great, sorghum is such a, a robust crop that, that it's possible to come up with, with a productive germplasm. Uh, my uh, current uh, efforts are uh, focused on brown midrib hybrid seed sorghum with anthracnose resistance. And we use a somewhat different breeding strategy here, not so much introgression, but breeding with material that has brown midrib already in it from the beginning. Um, and um, I hope I've shown you through some of these examples the, the uh, interaction between the plant breeding and the uh, genetics experiments, so uh, it's, it's a great, great system uh, to have interactions where, where you benefit uh, from the genetics work in the breeding and where the breeding can help with the genetics experiments. And uh, I'm optimistic that at some point we'll be able to redesign some of these enzymes uh, with, with the help of genome editing uh, strategies. So we're, um, we are, as I have mentioned, uh, dealing with uh, low oil and gas prices that are complicating things uh, in Florida. Uh, we've seen the repeal of one of the major incentives uh, behind biofuels that has led to uh, venture capital being uh, pulled out and, and some of the companies that, are, that were building biorefineries uh, have to stop. I hope that um, this will change at some point through perhaps uh, changes in tax policies. And there is talk about that. And I imagine that we have some of these similar challenges in India. 
So with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, the students and postdocs uh, in my lab. I have uh, uh, a number of um, very good uh, people, and uh, here is a, a photo uh, of them. Um, Indian postdocs, Anirta Shukla, uh, joined last year, and then a number of colleagues uh, at, uh, at the University of Florida and other locations. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks, Will. Uh, Wilfred, actually, very nice to see your talk. Particularly the nanotubes with the lignin is something very, very amazing. Mm. So, can I open the topic for discussion? Or some questions from your side? Yeah, very nice uh, talk, Wilfred. So about the first part, this endocrine resistance, you mentioned you have fine map to the six genes. So any usual suspects in those six and are kinase or something like that? Yeah, exactly. So there is the, the, the so we went through the the annotation and uh, there are some of the kind of usual suspects in there, the you know, kinases, uh, receptor kinases are in there, uh, chitinases. So I we just have to go through it uh, one by one, and or uh, actually with so few we can do it all in parallel and uh, and see what happens and with the potential that uh, they they work together, right? So it's possible that you need two genes to get the maximum resistance. But so hopefully, if I come on visit again, I'll have the answer for you. <laughs> Wilfred, I didn't get any introduction, but could you give us an update around lignocellulosis? Is, is it economic, economic at the moment? Like, is there commercial uh, factories out there that, that can uh, implement that process in a cost-effective manner? Yeah, that's a, a tough uh, question at the moment. So uh, there were three large industrial uh, lignocellulosic factories that opened last year. And at this point, only one of them is still sort of limping along, and two just decided to, uh, to, to halt their operations precisely for the techno-economic reasons that I pointed out. It's, it's just too difficult to compete with, with oil at the moment. And uh, so that, that, that's a frustrating situation because, as I mentioned, it's unlikely that oil will remain this cheap for you know, another 10 years. I mean, I obviously can't look into the future, but uh, you know, this is a, a case where um, the economics are just not working out. So at, when, when, when the oil prices were, were above $100 a gallon, this would have been manageable, but uh, at the moment, no. You know, follow on from yeah. that. The, the developments in the process, so one of the reasons why it might not be economic is because of the low oil prices. Um, but you can also, there was this view that you can have cheap feedstock going into mm -hmm. these processes, you know, so offshoot from uh, forestry products. Yeah. So the feedstock can be cheap. So is the current non-competitive aspect around the chemical processes to do the lignocellulosis? And is there, do you see prospects of making that much more? Efficient? Yeah, so the, the pretreatment itself is quite costly, as is the, the enzymes. Um, so the enzyme price has come down quite a bit, but it's still not, not free. Um, so the feedstock itself, I think, is not really the bottleneck. It's, it's the, the processing, and uh, yeah, that's just a matter of uh, waiting for the oil price to, to go back up, I think, unfortunately. You know, and I, I mentioned the level playing field. I mean, one of the things that are often overlooked is that 
know, the oil companies get tax incentives. Um, we do not typically pay for the uh, health associated uh, consequences of using uh, oil products like you know, air pollution, and, and people having uh, asthma from it. You know, so if you were to factor all of those things in, you know, the, the true cost of oil is much higher than than what we pay, and uh, you know that would if if that would be a willingness to to consider that in the price biofuels would be much more attractive, but that's just not the reality. So. Yes. On a similar line, um, so your number of dollar 98 cents per gallon is very impressive. Yeah. Did you add that uh, 10 hours of drive when you drove your materials? <laughs> <laughs> no, no this, 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 this would be, uh, this would, this was calculated on the assumption that you would have the feedstock relatively close by uh, the, the facility. So the, the numbers I showed you were based on, on the production at the pilot by a refinery, but for a larger scale industrial operation close to the site of feedstock production. So yeah, no, this, the, the $1.98 was not specific for our uh, you know, shipment of bagasse from Memphis. So. Yeah, I know. DuPont yeah. opened, I was with DuPont before, so they opened one in Nevada. You know, yes. I don't know whether it's closed or still working. Because they said they will collect only within 20 miles. Yeah. Of right, exactly. Right. Yeah, I think that typically the 50 miles is considered the outer limit of what you can feasibly do. If not, uh, I, I don't have a question but a comment. Uh, uh, even at Ikrisat, uh, when we worked on a very high scale on the biofuels commercialization aspects, in fact, uh, our closing statement was almost the same as you showed. That while it is um, techno technical, it is feasible to produce biofuel from Switzerland. The economic viability needs <laughs> it's a question mark, but it needs a lot of policy yeah. incentives because uh, the environmental benefits were not accrued in while, Precisely. while uh, uh, putting the price, you know, fixing the price for it. So that's wh what we are trying to educate even the policy makers. I think there is some realization coming up like it. And also more so, um, the sugar mills particularly are increasingly looking at alternative feedstocks to increase their operations, the factory operations. And after that, the biofuel price has been increased in the country, particularly in India. When we worked, it was around rupees 22 per liter. Today, it is 48. Mm -hmm. It is in a three years time. So it looks quite impressive as of today. And uh, mills, as of now, some six uh, sugar mills in six states are testing this locations. And hopefully, that gives a new credit Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. All Very right. Nice presentation. Thank you.